Welcome to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the film series with lively discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach cinema studies at the College of Staten Island. Today we'll be seeing Frank Camper's classic, Meet John Doe. Starring Gary Cooper and Barbara Stanwyck, this political drama summarizes a number of the themes of Camper's films, both that precede and, in fact, that follow it. We'll be talking about that and a host of other things after the film. Our guests today are going to be Professor Morris Dickstein from Queens College and President Edmund Volpe of the College of Staten Island. I hope you enjoy Meet John Doe. Point two. Hi. Welcome back to Cinema Then, Cinema Now. Tonight we have two guests and I'd like to introduce them to you uh, right now. My first guest is President Edmund Volpe of the College of Staten Island. Uh, before President Volpe took his presidential robes, he had a career, he still has it, keeps up with these things, as a scholar of modern American uh, literature. His A Reader's Guide to Faulkner has in fact been in print over 20 years, still keeps rolling, rolling off the presses, and he still keeps his hand in all of these matters aside from all the other things that a president has to do. Um, my other guest is Professor Morris Dickstein of Queens College. He's a member of the English department at Queens College, but he's also part of the consortium of film faculty at, uh, at Queens. He's published widely, both in literature and in film. He's editor of major film, major film directors, and has uh, been working recently on a book on America in the 1930s, which will include a chapter on Frank Capra. I think that's already in print, as a matter, mm -hmm. as, as a matter of fact. Well, it might be a good place to start just with the fact that this is a film very much from the American um, uh, 1930s. Ed, if, if you might, could you, you know, just give us a little <coughs> bit of context from the, the, what's going on, um, you know, in the other arts, but also what's, what's going on in the United States at this period? I mean, well, the, uh, what, what struck me about the film as I watched it again after many years, was the continuity in Frank Copper's vision and the vision of so many of the American writers of that period. Yeah. There has been a, an idealism that I think has characterized American literature and American writers, a, uh, an idealism that has been subjected to intense criticism by most of our writers. What you have in, in uh, Copper, I think, is that very positive strain, the, uh, the vision of what America can be, the, the vision of the small man, the, the, something that Carl Sandburg was able to express in a magnificent poetic fashion in The People, Yes, or, or even the, the vision of a Walt Whitman, which is a very positive vision, vision about uh, the United States and, and its people. So I think uh, there is, uh, what struck me was that continuity. Here we have a director working out of Hollywood with roots that seem to be in the literary tradition, the cultural tradition of, of America. Yeah. Well, we might stop just for a second, I was thinking, Morris, and talk about how this comes about biographically for Capra. I mean, his background itself is really quite interesting, how he hooks into this. Yes, he, it, it's interesting that the greatest upholders of the American dream in the 20th century have usually turned out to be immigrants. He, he himself was born in 1897 he, uh, in Sicily. He came over with his family when he was six years old. He eventually became the first of his family ever to attend college. Uh, he studied engineering and gradually uh, sort of slid into the, the technical side of film. And 
Uh, the first film that he, for, films he directed were with the uh, with the Senate and Hal Roach studios, the comedy studios in the 1920s. He's the one who at least took some claims for creating the screen personality of Harry Langdon. Oh, yeah. And uh, and in retrospect, you can see that the the simple the, the simple character, the simple innocent character played by Langdon in the, in the few good films he made in the 1920s, uh, were a forerunner of the sort of common man hero that you get in the more true Capra films of the 1930s and 1940s. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. We also, in the, in the visual arts of this time, I mean, obviously we have the commissions of the federal government themselves, but uh, after some of the, I should put the hermetic strain of modernism, uh, in, in the 20s we open up into these public murals, uh, a great era of public works, of public uh, a vision of America, and itself reaffirming a whole host of things challenged um, by the Depression. And I think he his pictures almost have that feel of being a kind of great mural of the of the the common man about them. As, uh, <coughs> it's, as, as it's a good point. You you uh, bring to mind the great murals of the uh, the NR the NRA days uh, when they really put artists to work. The government was was trying to support the artists, and uh, they have a very distinct style, which is almost the fabulistic quality that you're getting in a uh, Capra film. That's a very good point. Yeah, that's, uh, that kind of brings us to Frank Capra and fairy tale. Uh. Yes, it's not exactly clear though how Capra came to this common man figure because although it's there in the personality of Harry Langdon, if you look at his films of the early 1930s, certainly Clark Gable and It Happened One Night is not yeah. exactly the common man, though he has a common touch. and. And his first political film, before the, the, the better known ones of the late 30s, is a film of 1932 about the bank failures called American Madness. And uh, there you have Walter Brennan, who's, who's and the hero is a bank president, not exactly the common man uh, either, though it's, uh, it's based on a well-known bank figure in California of the time who did sort of have the common yeah. touch. But it was only uh, in Mr. Deeds uh, Goes to Town in 1936 that Capra really settled on that common man figure for good. Now that comes after the remarkable success of the uh, screwball of the screwball comedy It Happened One Night. Um, so it's almost as if that success allowed him, I mean, would you say, to, to, I mean, to, to bring forth this? Because there's, there's a remarkable consistency in the films that come from after uh, It Happened yes, One Night yes. of the next four or five, I mean, throughout the, the rest of the films he makes, but that really clustering of four, five, six films that, that issue in the next 10 to, yeah. to 12 years or so. Well, he gives a very interesting account of this in his uh, autobiography, a book called The Name Above the Title. And he, you know, It Happened One Night was the first, and until recently, the only film ever to sweep all the major Academy Awards. And he describes having gone into a real funk after that success and having had the equivalent of a nervous breakdown. And, and then going to see a kind of quasi therapy figure, uh, sort of mysterious figure, who who then tells him, "Are you going to just lie in this slough of despond? Are you going to f pull yourself up and do something about it?" And in, in a number of his subsequent films, he has a scene like that where the hero goes through a sort of emotional crisis, yeah. which is often compared to Jesus on the cross, and uh, and and then manages somehow to recapture his energy and vitality and to, to give the film some kind of positive ending. Sometimes he had difficulty, as in this film, arriving at that, at that uh, positive ending. But uh, that became the prototype. I think it was the, it was the experience of having himself gone through uh, an emotional crisis that he was unprepared for that gave him the additional psychological <coughs> depth that he hadn't really had in any of his earlier films. Yeah, and of course it's a crisis brought on, ironically, by, by characters who get success. I mean, the crisis comes in a moment in which they're successful and they say, well, what, what does this mean? I mean, after all, we are now successful in America. What do you do with it since the, the, the culture seems to be so much set up for striving towards as opposed to getting something? What do you, there's a wonderful line in Michael Ritchie's uh, mm -hmm. film, The Candidate, and after which the candidate has won his election. And at the end of the film, he's, the last line is, so what do I do now? And it's almost as if that crisis, uh, th these films chronicle the moment in which somebody gets it. You get it, and then the film works out that set of crises mm. that are going to come through. Well, what actually happens in these films, though, is not so much a crisis of dealing with success, 
but the uh, a parable, and here we get to the fairy yeah. tale element, of the lone individual, the common man, up against uh, forces which are very similar to a kind of Marxist or left-wing description of America in the 1930s, of trusts, of monopolies, of forces that control banks and newspapers and so on. And the, the, the fairy tale is usually that of the, the innocent and often quite ignorant individual, but with the kind of helpings of idealism and Native American strength and fortitude, up against all of those forces which at first overwhelm him, but gradually somehow he's able to go through this crisis and through a kind of catharsis in which he is pilloried by these forces, and uh, somehow, uh, though it becomes more and more difficult from film to film, able to, to manage to defeat them in the course of the film. So that is the, the emotional crisis uh, tends to be a crisis that begins, starting with Mr. Deeds, to overlap with the political situation in the United States, uh, with uh, an analysis of what uh, of the role of the common man in a society in which the forces of democracy seem readily subject to manipulation by these these oligarchical and monopolistic yeah. forces. Yeah. That's it's, also the the uh, world situation that's coming to yes. play, and especially in this film, right. where you have the uh, figure with his motor troops. Yes, storm Oh yes, yes, it's it's really it's very, very dark in its vision that way. And also, visually, there are I mean, clear echoes that a popular, we talk about uh, Capra as a populist filmmaker, well, one of the things that's, that we have to consider in that regard is that he's making films for people who have seen certain kinds of visual materials. So if you go, as the average American did in the, in the 30s and the 40s, if you go to the movie theater, you see the newsreels, one of the things you're going to be seeing is newsreel footage of the Nazi rallies. You're going to be seeing footage of Mussolini. You're going to be seeing footage of um, May 1st Red, De Red Square things. And when you see those, that private uh, motorcycle core, you get an immediate echo. Wait a minute. We know, right. we know it was these other guys who had this sort of thing. What is this going on um, in, our, in, our own, in our own backyard? Now, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call him a political director in that sense. I think the echoes are very much there. Mm -hmm. But his battle, uh, the oppositions are fundamentally moral, the okay. good and the evil. And they are projected, th those forces of good and evil are projected in social terms. The innocent American with the hope that he's going to get along with everyone, that, that uh, happiness is at the end of the road, uh, against the forces which, uh, again, in, in terms of uh, economic terms, the capitalistic forces, the rich people, become the powerful and the villainous. So that uh, you have, I think, uh, much more a social and a moral texture yeah. in his vision and, and what you see in the films. We had the uh, wonderful opportunity of having Frank Capra stay with us for two and a half days in 1978 when we gave him an honorary degree. And uh, I carry away from those two and a half days many wonderful memories, uh, his voice still clear and ringing, uh, sitting at the kitchen table and talking, his wife Lou, a, a real affection existing between them after many years of, of marriage. And what you see in the films is Frank Capra, yeah. the, the, the personality he is, was able to project, that uh, whole sense of, of uh, destiny, of, of himself, of his part in the, in the American experience, in the American scene. He spoke as he directed. And that was a rich, rich experience. Well, that brings up a really interesting point about there weren't many directors who explicitly were allowed to address, uh, address or inform an audience with their personality in the 30s. Now, people now argue, I think appropriately, I think you probably agree, that a John Ford was always his own man or a Howard Hawks or whatever. But Capra has a kind of special history in that way in his dealings with the, uh, with the studios. Well, before the sound era, the only ones who were really able to do that were, were the great comedy directors like Chaplin and Keaton, who, who not only mostly directed their own films, but also played themselves. And therefore, they were able to incarnate themselves right on the screen. Uh, and Chaplin certainly, and, and Keaton in other ways, gives a, 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 us a foreigner of that kind of common man figure in a quite different sense. Uh, I think that the key to, uh, 
to Capra's success and being able to put his stamp on his films uh, was not simply that he was very good and commercially very successful from the very beginning, but that he, uh, he worked at a studio, Columbia, which at, at that time was a very small backstreet studio run by a man by the name of Harry Cohn. And uh, Capra directed many forgotten films, uh, films that are forgotten today for Columbia before he had the great success with It Happened One Night. But it was precisely that, that he didn't work uh, at a studio like MGM, which was controlled by a tyrant like uh, Louis Mayer, uh, that, a that enabled Capra to, to, to uh, put both a studio on the map and also to, to uh, assume for himself the kind of control over the films that was impossible in a huge film factory like MGM. Yeah, so that it, it, <laughs> considering what Columbia Pictures is today or the reputation mm -hmm. it has, we, we, what we're essentially doing is recovering the fact that he put them on the map, that <coughs> Frank Capra and the excellence of Columbia Pictures were synonymous for a period, uh, for a period of time. Now, eventually, after 12 years or so, there was a parting of the ways, and Meet John Doe was actually the first film that he made after he broke with Columbia, and it was his first independent production, though he was able to use many of the same actors, like Gary Cooper and the screenwriter Robert Riskin, uh, whom he'd used before at, at Columbia. But uh, this was very much of a chancy economic thing for Capra to go off on his own. He invested, he, bank, he mortgaged his house, went off, invested all of his own money, and so on which left all of Hollywood, you know, independent production was a much more rare thing at the right. time than it is today. And uh, everyone was watching to see whether this would uh, succeed or whether Capra would fall on his face, as the studios, I think, hoped that he would. And well, we, we might talk just a little bit about what did happen to this film. First of all, it was a troubled film in the, in the script. I mean, I think that shows up in some, in some ways in the completed film, um, not ways that are unpleasing, necessarily. I, what about... What about uh, the ending of this film, gentlemen? I mean, it is quite an ending. Uh, the one you see. The, the one, one you see, see is not very uh, satisfying. But, yeah, that's, well, uh, that's, uh, in some sense, that's the point. It isn't satisfying. It isn't, I think the New York Times, uh, whenever they have to say something about it, they, they keep saying, he should have jumped. <laughs> <It's the stand. laughs> he should have jumped. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did in one one but, version. I yes, understand. There were four, apparently four separate other endings that circulated before he actually got the whole cast back and then filmed this final ending. And this is when someone wrote to him that said, "Really, the John Doe's of the other world would be the only ones that could convince him not to jump." And so he assembled the John Doe's, and they convinced him not to jump. And I think the the ending is appropriate in one sense. Uh, when when D.B. Norton says to him at the end, you know, it's futile, you know, we're, we're just going to bury you in Potter's Field, you know, your gesture will be meaningless. And then when Ann Mitchell appeals to him, no, don't jump, don't jump, the truth is that they have him over a barrel. The point is that this is a very dark film. It's a film in which uh, the, the common man hero has the least understanding of what he's doing, has the least power against these large, almost fascistic forces. And by the end, and Capra does not really retract that. You know, in, in the, the previous film, uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Jimmy Stewart doesn't really succeed at the end either. It's only that Claude Rains has a change of heart and tries to yeah. kill himself. That after, after Mr. Smith has completely failed, suddenly there's a sort of deus ex machina, and he is, he is vindicated at the end. But here it's even worse because uh, they really have him over a barrel, whether he jumps or doesn't jump. Uh, it's pointless. He's been exposed. He's the, the, the people that he put his, his faith and hope in, all the John Doe's of the world, have turned upon him. They've proved to be fickle. They've proved that they're re easily manipulated by the D.B. Nortons of the world. And therefore, it's a relatively meaningless gesture. And the, the truth is that the ending is therefore true to the film itself, because at the end of the film, there's really nothing more for him to do. He has really lost it. Yeah. Well, it's, the ending of this film is very interesting in the context of other Hollywood films of the period because one of the things that's most characteristic of them is film scholars have done a lot of work on and I think everybody just knows intuitively that you get a clear cut ending. You either have a triumph of one thing or or another. This film seems to leave a whole set of questions open. I mean there there he's not I don't know if I to, I don't know if he's completely defeated. I mean, the, at least the, the people are back with the common, with the common people. I guess what I'm moving towards is a notion that the, the ending is mixed. Well, if, if, you, if you accept a thematic ending here, uh, I, I see the last scene as a kind of reverse pieta, where the Christ figure is holding the mother or the woman who has saved him. And 
uh, you do have the meek shall inherit the earth theme starting very early in the in the picture right. so that there is a continuity and perhaps a a logical conclusion when you when you have that kind of an ending i think probably that's what he was depending upon to when he decided this would be the ending but visually it's very dark it's very yeah. muted and in a sense the culmination cinematically of the film is really the convention scene where which oh, looks yeah. so funereal and where he goes through his his crucifixion his his uh, you know and uh, and this is the equivalent I think in Mr. Smith of uh, of the crucifixion of Jimmy Stewart on the floor of the Senate and that's the emotional culmination of the film and the the little bit of a happy ending that's that's tacked on is sort of something like the kind of thing that you get in a Dickens novel like Little Dorrit a very muted and uh, happy ending for which no claims are really made in terms of overthrowing the kinds of forces that you've seen the darker forces that you've seen at work in the course of the film. Right. Uh, just to draw an analogy with another artist, that, that turns out to be, in a number of films, one of Hitchcock's strategies as well. The, the, false, the falsely... The happy ending that doesn't that's not really very happy, like the ending of Suspicion or a film like that. Right. Uh, I, I was also thinking of the ending of, of Psycho, where we, have mm -hmm. a, uh, where we have a psychiatrist come in and give a truly preposterous explanation right. for the whole set of, whole set of things. Sort of self-exploding Hollywood-style ending. Yes, yeah, exactly. This don't blame Hollywood. The Greeks did it, too. <laughs> <laughs> it goes way back. They named it. <laughs> that brings us, uh, Greeks is a good, you know, kind of uh, transition over to the fact that these characters have a kind of psychology, but they're not really, I mean, the, the kinds of, of characters of significant psychological depth that we associate with the rise of the psychological novel in the 19th and 20th century. These aren't those kinds, uh, no. uh, n kinds of characters, but I think they're rich characters uh, still. Well, uh, they are richer, I think, than some of the characters in Copper's other pictures, which are flatter and more representative of good, of evil, a simpler people. Right. I don't think that uh, though the hero John Doe is uh, simple-minded in many ways. Uh, there are forces working there, and he, he wants money. He's not doing this out of the, the goodness of his heart. Uh, he's not one of those that are going to inherit the earth automatically. He's got to get money to fix his elbow. So that, uh, and, I, and you have within the, the heroine, the, her own greed, her, her desires, her ambitions, uh, mixed with her desire to take care of her mother and her, her children, her love of her father, the gentle, good person. And so they're, they're complicated characters. Yeah, I guess the, one of the things I was going, um, going after, since you people are always going after things with questions or asking of topics, is we begin with something you talked about a little bit earlier. We begin with almost a mythological type, particularly within an American context. We begin with the baseball player, the American, the American sport. We begin with, uh, um, a prototype of the, of the 30s film, at least, the American career woman uh, that pops up again and again and is a very strong character through that. And he, he puts, he and Riskin, give Riskin, they put twists on these, mm. twists on these matters. They begin with the recognizable character, uh, character type, and then from there, I mean, are baseball players supposed to need money for operations? I mean, it's well, in the Depression, perhaps, yeah. It's the, there you get the social theme, and, and Capra does tend to work with types, and which of course fits into the. He's a great user of, of like Preston Sturgis of Hollywood character actors. Oh, absolutely. And he, whom he picks really not for their psychological complexity, obviously, but for their voices and their faces. Uh, Graham Greene, in one of his film reviews, said that Capra is on the level of the great Russians in his the way he contemplates the human face. And uh, the the thing that I think that makes this more complex is that Capra's cinema is really a cinema of ideas, even though the ideas may not be very complex, but the number of viewpoints he gives you on these ideas makes it complex. Uh, in the ordinary fairy tale, you would have just the characters right. of good and evil. In Capra's films, you tend to have at least a triple structure. You have the evil characters, often personified by someone like Edward Arnold. Then you have the good characters, personified usually by the mothers and fathers or by the common man hero. But always in between, you have these basically these hard-shelled, hard-boiled, cynical characters who are redeemable and who help to redeem and save and wise up the, the common man hero who is good but who is ignorant of the, the way the world really works. And, and in this film, it's, it's uh, Anne Mitchell, played by Barbara Stanwyck, <laughs> and it's uh, Connell, played by uh, James Gleason, extremely well. And 
The classic Capra scene, absolutely classic Capra scene, is when Cannell tells him what's in the speech that he's, got, he's about to give the, the following night. And, the, and Capra was at his best in giving you his sentimental and patriotic values, uh, not directly, but in a barroom scene like that where a guy is sloshy drunk and you're seeing under the surface of this hard-boiled, cynical character, and he is in the process of recovering some kind of buried idealism or belief in America or moral goodness that you never noticed in that character until that point, or you barely glinted in that character. And so you have a mutual redemption. This, this character in the middle clues in the good character who is in the process of being crucified, and he in turn has been the agent of redemption for that character who otherwise was too wised up and too cynical uh, to ever accept any of the ideals that the film's more or less ambivalently based on. There's another, there's another level that I would add in your structure, and that's represented by his friend. The is colonel. it the colonel? Colonel, sure. yes. That, that is uh, particularly interesting to me because uh, it's, I don't think it's in the other Capra films that I can remember. Yeah. Here you have like a, a plea for the open road, for absolute freedom, that if you get caught up in any way with a woman, with a job, with desire for money, with need for money, then your freedom is going to go. Uh -huh. And there's a wonderful scene during the radio speech when the colonel is at the door and he keeps moving it and back and forth. You can go out, you can free yourself, you're not trapped yet. And of course he represents that throughout. Th there's a very interesting aspect also to him because I think um, most people are unfamiliar with the word helot until they come to the from this film and as much as he represents this this potential freedom there's also something enigmatic about his forceful expressive but enigmatic and people say what you know when he says something like that and that brings us to the distinctly american language of of this kind of film i mean it's it's clip of its dialogue the, the particular the, the diction the diction of the characters the kind of vocabulary they have strikes me as bringing this american english very strongly to the forefront is one of the definitions of our, of, of our culture. Well, this is one of the things that uh, Capra loved in Riskin's screenplays and what he, why he used him. And uh, though you find it uh, just as well in, in other screenplays of his, the previous film, Mr. Smith, had been written by someone else, Sidney Buckman, and it has exactly that same quality. So it's clearly Capra that must have been in many ways responsible for it. But I think it's very important, the role of the colonel, because it does give the film that additional complexity that the other Capra films right. don't have. And I think one of the reasons for that is that Capra was extremely sensitive that the, what he calls the intellectual critics had made fun of his films all through the 30s, that although they were generally critically <coughs> successful and very successful commercially, they were made fun of for their simplicities and their sentimentalities and their so-called Capricorn. And I think the introduction of a figure like the Colonel, adding one additional layer of complexity to this cinema of ideas, uh, Capra boasts in his autobiography that he really, for the first time, had won the approval of the intellectual critics, which he says he had very much desired. And other people have said, well, that's just what's wrong with this film, that he's begun to make films about themes rather than about people and so on. So there is a division of opinion about whether it was right for Capra to go for that, that greater complexity, though I think it works extremely well. Yeah. Well, I was also thinking about the fact that the, the, the language which, when we read about how some of these American films, and Capra's not alone in this, but uh, uh, um, were received abroad. I mean, this, this sense of American dialogue was something that excited a lot of people. I've, uh, it's about the, the English novelist Elizabeth Bowen would say she would just go to the movies, not because she could ever write this sort of thing herself, because she was coming out of a very different tradition, but she just liked to hear this kind of speech. Well, one of the things that becomes interesting is that it may be new, it may be cynical, it may have a new power to it, but it also can be extraordinarily deceptive as well. Because we, you know, we see someone like the Ann Mitchell character who begins and you know, is a journalist herself, has this command, and yet she gets herself into a lot of trouble with her command of, uh, uh, of language. Words. And words. But also and because this is a film about deception and fraud. And in, oh. in many ways, it's also a film about uh, acting and about putting on a performance because this whole John Doe stunt, after all, is a promotional stunt, right. which relates to forces of manipulative capitalism and politics in America. But at the same time, what they do to John Doe early on is that they give him acting lessons. And at the end, when they expose him, they say, you're a fake. You've been putting on a performance. You've been paid for it. And um, when they appeal to John Doe not to run away after he's run away, 
They appeal to him with much the same simplicities with which Capra appealed to his audience. And there is, I think, another layer on this yeah. film of, of the, the whole John Doe idea is, in a sense, Capra's relation to his own filmmaking and his own belief. And he was very aware of the criticism of his simple verities uh, and, and across the country, even though it was very much loved. And, and that, that dialogue, however, is very important because beyond the level of characters symbolizing or representing one thing or another, that's the level at which you truly get the common man idea. That snap and crackle of the dialogue gives you the, the detailed, concrete version of precisely that faith in the Native American personality and of American values that Capra was dedicated to, though he, as we've said, also saw the, the, the darker side, the underside, and, and, uh, and they became more important as his filmmaking proceeded. So well, up five hamburgers, five sodas, and five pieces of apple pie. Right, right. <laughs> well, what I've got to say at this point is that it's a good takeout order for us <laughs> because we're going to have to go away right, right now. Um, if you'd like more information about Cinema Then, Cinema Now, uh, please send a self-addressed stamped envelope to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. Let me repeat that information for you, okay? If you'd like more information about this series or about cinema studies, graduate or undergraduate, please send us a self-addressed stamped envelope at Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. I hope that our discussion of Frank Capra's Meet John Doe leads you to discussion and thought that you enjoy. Thanks for joining us.